What's going on, everybody? Welcome to BKB Podcast, episode number nine. Today, Sonny and I are joined by uh, Sim Sahi, um, and we are going to be talking about finances and life insurance. So what's up, brother? Not much, man. How you doing? <laughs> good, good. Uh, so having me. Let, let's, oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, let's start from the beginning then. Where were you born and how was life growing up? Oh, man, I haven't been asked that in a long time, but uh, <laughs> born a long time ago in the 70s uh, in Vancouver at Children's at Grace Hospital, which is now uh, Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was back in 1976 and grew up, you know, in Morberley, right between Maine and Fraser. Okay. And South <laughs> of town, yes. So uh, very proud of our uh, humble beginnings and, uh, you know, grew up there. Uh, moved to Surrey in 2002 okay. and, and have been here since. So almost okay. half my life in Surrey. Half, so more believe it was Surrey before Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, before we get into like the meat and potatoes portion, I know you're kind of involved in some of the basketball stuff or at least seen some posts of basketball. So, yes. you know, what's going on with that? Are you involved with some of the basketball programs or your kids involved with that or, or, or what's up with what the basketball side so, of things? So growing up in the eighties, you know, we played kind of sports. Uh, nowadays it's kids are specialized maybe a bit too early, you know, two years old and, you know, they got their own personal trainer for a specific sport, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But back then as you just go outside, play, you know, ball hockey, uh, football, soccer, basketball wasn't as popular at that time, but uh, right around the mid eighties, early eighties, it was uh, Magic Johnson, and Larry Bird era. Mm -hmm. So you grew up a Lakers fan because you didn't like the Celtics. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Michael Jordan came along, and everyone was a Jordan fan. And uh, so started playing basketball in the eighties, fell in love with the game, and um, now we have an organization called Into Hoops Canada. Okay. And we're hosting our thirty fifth annual tournament. Our wow. National Okay, nice. Center. So uh, first term was in 1985 and it was actually run by the roster of Goodwater. Okay, okay. And so it was run for the first decade by the Temple, uh, but gym costs, referee costs, it got very expensive. And for them, it was like, hey, you know what? And you know, Goodwater are, you know, they're run by 70 year olds, you know, my, my grandfather back in the day and, uh, and they figured they know what's best for the kids, right? Mm -hmm. So they put all their extra money to a buddy instead of basketball because they felt, <laughs> You know, that would be better for the community. And uh, so someone had to step up. Luckily, I just graduated from high school and had some summer jobs, you know, working multiple jobs. And uh, I could save up to kind of help run those tournaments. Mm -hmm. I took over the reins there. And yeah, here we are many, many years later. Um, it should be our 39th or 38th year. But, you know, a couple of years, uh, uh, there was no basketball there with COVID for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And also uh, got married, had kids and, you know, the wife was like, hey, you know what? Spend more time on your kids rather than other people's kids. Fair enough, yeah. And, uh, so, uh, but you know, things have worked out. Uh, two great partners, uh, Surrender Gurwal at BC Prep mm -hmm. and uh, Verinder Bridge from Abbots, where he's a vice principal right now in Langley. Uh, so the three of us kind of, it's made it easier We have three individuals who have uh, the right intent. Um, so, you know, between the three of us, uh, everyone respects us and uh, it just, it brings the community together. And we have, I think, over 300 ex-college players from our community who are currently playing or have played in the tournament. Mm -hmm. and, and that's male and female. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's fun. And yeah, and this year, it's at Langley Event Center, which is the, you know, the biggest uh, facility outside of Vancouver you could look at, you know, in terms of uh, a multi-sport facility. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this year we added, um, we're adding the women's division and also a youth division. So uh, it should be, yeah, it's May 5th to 7th. So first weekend of May. Okay. We'll definitely put something in the description and the show notes. So people Appreciate can kind of check it out. Just uh, hit the link and then they get more information about it. No, so not. in terms of, so in terms of education from, from early days, you know, high school, where'd you get, where'd you go to college or university? And then, you know, maybe even something about how, you know, what did you do for work in the beginning and how did it eventually lead you into like the financial sector or, you know, into the life insurance industry? Yeah, no. Um, so grew up parents, you know, just like how your parents probably were blue collar, came from India. Mom came in 69. So she came here a long time ago and then dad came in 75. And, you know, they pretty much drove across Canada to find work. Yeah, uh, yeah. They even sent me back to India to live with my grandparents when I was uh, a year and a half old. 
So I spent uh, two years with my grandparents and then came back at when I was three or four. Uh, again, grew up in South Vancouver for high school. I went to the West side because all my fr- all my friends were troublemakers, believe it or not, <laughs> growing up where I did. Uh, luckily, I was good with numbers, uh, which is kind of, you know, uh, you could say it was um, foreshadowing into my career today. Uh, and I got into a school in the West End called Eric Hamber, right by the Children's Hospital and uh, in the Math Honors Program. And then played a lot of basketball. Uh, I transferred to another private school called Vancouver College, uh, the Fighting Irish. It's a high school uh, in grade 10 and went there for three years and, um, you know, graduate my B at UBC. Okay, and, nice. And then right after university, just, just like many others, you know, because uh, you don't get much direction from your parents because, you know, being first generation, they're just like, Barlo, right? Barla. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and uh, just, I'm like, what am I supposed to study, right? And, you know, they get there. They get their input from some other regular, you know, uncle. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, we always have that one uncle in the family who's made a little bit of money in real estate or something, and they become experts on health, finance, and yeah. marriage, <laughs> and everything else. And even though, you know, uh, they got their, you know, they themselves have bad habits, right? Oh, yeah. and so my dad would take counsel from them and kind of relay it to me and be like, oh, you know, you should do this. And uh, I like to read. I was good with numbers, and I was a history major, and you know, that same uncle is like, if you study history, you're going to become history. You know, like, <laughs> a typical Bollywood line, you know. You know? Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, but I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, even when I talk to the younger generation out there, take people in their teens or even the 20s and 30s, people still haven't figured it out. You know, mm-hmm. my line of work, I work with retirees and pensioners and, you know, they're in their 60s and 70s and they're just still like, they still have a runway of like 10, 20 years where they can still be fairly active and they want to do things. But they're like, man, we had no idea what we were going to do. We just kind of figured it out, you know, as we went. And, um, but right after university, gone to workforce, uh, went in trucking <laughs> for okay. a couple of years. Yeah, I took that degree, put mm-hmm. it on my back. But I'm happy I did that because, um, you know, it built confidence within myself because, um, you know, I still realize I still have those blue collar roots that my parents have. And so I wasn't scared, afraid to work. And someone at that time said, hey, why don't you take a look at this industry, a very number of industries. So, you know, uh, I went to career night for one of the largest insurance companies in Canada. And, um, you know, I was intrigued. And, you know, there's some, you know, plus a chance, you know, being self-employed. My, my dad was self-employed in the auto industry. And so, you know, you can control your own hours. And uh, I knew that, this is something I wanted to do. I didn't realize I was going to be there for 18 years, which I am currently. And, uh, you know, luckily it's afforded me a good lifestyle and quality of life. And also just aside from the insurance side, uh, the relationships with my clients, uh, you know, they become like family members, you know, you meet someone and, you know, large majority are Indo-Canadian and in our community, you meet someone once and, Next day, you know, their kids and your kids are calling themselves cousins, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, know, you know, like people like, you know, all other friends, like, how are you guys cousins? Well, we're kind of not, but, you know, if you think about it, you know, like my parents <laughs> grew up in this village across the river was them. And, you know, someone got married in the family and we're cousins. <laughs> yeah, that's always it. <laughs> right. That's always and, it. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, uh, it's not even work, you know, whenever I talk to people, it's just like hanging out, you know, and uh, uh, which is the best part of of our line of work but they're going back that's that's kind of a background in how we started how i started mm-hmm. didn't you know didn't grow up in the in, in the 90s you know thinking hey i'm gonna do volunteer work running basketball tournaments i can sell insurance to these people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know i was still 10 years away from you know being involved in the industry okay and when you were younger did you have like a different outlook in terms of like oh i think i'm gonna do this when i get older and you kind of came upon the financial industry and yeah. and if so what was it what were you thinking you were yeah. going to be doing it was because um, back in the 80s cost of living wasn't as high so parents always you know and those are people you're most impressionable around the people who are always you know speaking to you and my parents like hey we came from a foreign country you know my dad had his master's in india but you couldn't you know utilize it here and that you know be blue collar uh, employees here until my dad started his business but did like go find a good job you know, and good jobs that time paid 50 grand in the 80s. And that was a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And house in Vancouver is 100 grand. And you're making 50 grand. You know, it's a two to one ratio. Yeah. Home to salary. 
That's like someone making a million bucks today, right? Mm-hmm. Twenty five dollars an hour was like you were banking it, man. <laughs> like, well, so even like my uncles who worked in the mill. Yeah, so I'm saying my dad was all at the mill. He, he worked. That was mill. huge, like you know. Yeah, and, like, uh, my dad's entire most of his life was at the mill, and they were 25, 26 bucks, and like, dude, they built everything with that. Like, yeah. And yeah, it's, was, it's it's hard to get by now with that, you know. Like, it's crazy how how much it's changed with with everything in terms of the economics. It's, it's and, tough. Right? They, they look at like um like what I'm even on myself like whatever I'm making an hour, and they laugh. They're like, "You're making this much," and like, "What are you doing with your life?" I'm like, look at "Everything else, though, man. Like, <laughs> of living going up. The housing is yeah. 10x. You know what I mean? More than that. More so than it's crazy. That, right? And yeah. so if you look at it back, there's a two to one ratio, and uh, but they're like, "Hey, go find a job." good benefits, pension, right? And today pensions are half of what they used to be. A lot of private companies don't have pensions like they used to because it's too expensive to administer. And uh, a lot of, um, um, you know, what was it pension and health benefits? And so all this stuff, you know, is, is not there, like, is not as strong as it used to be back then. And uh, so I was leaning more towards teaching and uh, or policing. Okay. Okay. Just because you know, I've always been like involved in coaching younger kids, whether it be basketball or soccer. And I was like, okay, even during university days, um, I, I coached a lot of high school basketball while I was at school. So at John Oliver, I coached senior boys basketball team there, uh, you know, right on Fraser and 41st. Mm-hmm. And uh, so something, else, but you know, stuff happens. Um, my parents had a family business. So I started helping them out, you know, during evenings and weekends while I was at UBC and, I'm good. at the time it was difficult to study and do well in school because your focus wasn't there because a lot of your friends are just folks in school. Mm-hmm. So at the time it was difficult, but I look, you know, um, your outlook is very important on how you project it. You know, you can take the best out of any, any scenario or the worst. And I was like, now I look at them, I'm so grateful that I got exposed to the business role and seeing what my parents and, you know, some of my relatives were doing. And I kind of realized at that time, Hey, you know, what? I don't want to do further schooling. Yeah. And and it reflected in my schoolwork. You know, it was just, I was just doing enough to get by, you know, just not, you know, not doing very well at it. Because if you're passionate about something, you do well at it. But I mentally checked out during my fourth year at university. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it, it was what it was, right? Because you become a byproduct of your environment. I was like, okay, hey, there's more to life than just becoming a, I can volunteer as a coach rather than be a teacher. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and policing, there was like a hiring freeze yeah back in like 97 i would say or 98 mm-hmm. uh, i'd passed my physical you know rcmp and all of that and then they're like reapply you know in a year and you know when you lose that and this is because i've done a rcmp program in richmond is a student program where you're a student constable for four months okay yeah loved it and but sometimes you know you're into it and all of a sudden for some reason like hey there's a hiring freeze cutbacks and I just lost my passion for it at that time. So again, you had to kind of pivot towards a different direction. Mm. Okay. So now that kind of brings us closer to present day a little bit, right? So I guess now let's get into the meat and potatoes portion of it. So you have, you were saying 18 years of experience in the field now? It'll be eight. I'll be starting my 18th year in April. Yeah. Okay. So just about, so you have plenty of experience. So this question is going to be a loaded one. So what would you say is kind of like, maybe I'll say one to three things, but you could, if you can narrow it down to one. And, and, you, and, and cut me off if I talk too much, man. Oh, no, totally cool. <laughs> totally cool. Um, what do you think are like the one to three things that you find are missing in terms of people's, you could say, we could say personal finances, or we could even say like planning for the future, because, you know, with, uh, especially culturally, you know, for us, it's like, you're talking about passing away. You're talking about having something planned afterwards. That's actually a bad, like, that's bad. You shouldn't be doing that. It's, there are quite a few people that are like that. You shouldn't do that. I, I feel like now it's changing. But what would you say in terms of just like people's personal finances or or planning for the future? What are like the top one to three things that maybe people are missing or, or, or kind of like maybe there's some opportunities there that they just don't see? Yeah. Well, one thing I realized is everyone's situation is unique. Um, you know, you see all the insurance people telling everyone, Hey, you got to buy insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all the investment people telling people, Hey, you got to go buy registered investments, like an RSP or TFSA or whatever else. Uh, everyone has done well in real estate. Hey, well, real estate's the way to go, which is great. If, yeah, if you have the means to, you know, purchase something. Uh, so that's the first thing is we got to realize is everyone's situation is unique. 
our community is the toughest to plan out for because we have too many experts in our own, in our own extended family trying to give us, you know, uh, sometimes it's timing and, you know, I, and I'm happy for everyone who's done well, I mean, especially because real estate's made our community very, very financially successful. Mm -hmm. And then real estate, you know, realtors, mortgage brokers, trades and all that, which is great. There's a lot of money that's been made in our community. And, uh, but first thing I'll tell people is, stop looking at what others are doing right. because and it's tough because I, I gave out that advice and I at the same time like man should I buy this vehicle or do we should do this for our kids or this trip or these clothes or whatever it might be you know we think the same way it, you know because it's it's around us all the time and, and it's been around us our whole lives you know uh being compared to what other, compared to others as kids now from, you know I remember growing up as parents you know my parents would always be like hey um um be like so and so <laughs> who did well in school and now they're like be be like so and so who did well in real estate who didn't go to school <laughs> mm -hmm. and that, that's our knock on our parents generation just the way they are right yeah and um so but the advice i would say is man like people look past the next year because everyone's living in the now Ooh. and sometimes it's hard because people are barely scraping by your tender sunny it's like Man, the basic cost of living is so high. And when these mortgage renewal rates come up, uh, you know, just imagine an extra $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 after tax a month. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what, you know, $3,000 after tax is what someone who's making 50 grand a year might bring yeah. home. Yeah. It's going to take a big toll on people. And I'm just hoping, and I worry about a lot of my clients because, you know, a lot of them have done well, but their assets are very high, but their month to month isn't. And, you know, it's just, so that's a loaded question because then you get into the weddings mm. and all this other stuff. It's just, uh, it's tough, man. It's just, when I talk to people like during COVID, I was I telling all my friends, go get married during COVID. Yeah. Just having something <laughs> I'm happy. Honestly, when COVID did away, I found that it was like a blessing because like yeah. I've been doing it with my gigs and stuff too. Like I played to all the weddings and everything, right? So yeah. just seeing what COVID did to the wedding industry, I, I love it. And like people actually realized you don't need the big weddings. Yeah. And like, you know, parents actually looked back and like, wow, we can save this much money, still have fun. And uh, but, you, you know what it, it is? It, a lot of it. So, sorry to cut you off, Sonny. So a lot of it is, and I found this out too, is our parents' generation is is kind of like at a point where they said like, well, so-and-so was at your wedding or our yeah. wedding, or they invited <laughs> us to this or that. <laughs> And I remember my list when, when my wife and I, when we're, we were making our list, we're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. We only have about like 250, 300 people all together. Yeah. And in come the parents, yeah. you know, and it's like 500 and like over 500 more people were invited. So that number went from, you know, 250 to 300 to 880 or 900. You know what I mean? And like, it just changes everything when it comes to like their opinion. But, you know, uh, in terms of the whole COVID thing, uh, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they both got like, I don't think they got married in 20, like in that year, but you, we, you know, COVID kind of lasted for like two years, you know what I mean? 2020, 2021. So they were able to kind of ride that wave and they wouldn't have the big fat Indian wedding. So, and they're, I, I think they were happy with the situation because you know, when you start to, you enjoy yourself the wedding week, but then when you look at that price tag afterwards of like every, all the expenses, it's like, holy crap, what did we do? That's like, could have gone towards a down payment on a property or, or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's, um, and it takes, and usually the parents are paying for a majority of it and they're taking out lines of credits, you know, to, cause no one's got liquid savings in our parents' generation. It's all real estate or if they have a pension at work. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. and again, we always think every, we see a couple of our friends doing well. We think the whole community has got 10 houses. Yeah, that was right. <laughs> on, on average people have one home. Yeah. 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 Right. And then, um, so it's the bank technically owns. <laughs> so, um, but come at that question, just backtracking a little bit, Shin, is first thing I would tell people is figure out what you want out of life. Right. What do you want? And sometimes it's hard when you're 25 or 30 starting your life, like, Hey, what do I want out of life? Because you don't know. I, I'm, you know, I'm in my mid forties now and still trying to figure it out. I'm very happy where I'm at, but I have no idea where life's going to take me with, you know, our kids going to high school in the next couple of years, or, you know, as we age, there might be some health issues. Our parents are aging. 
-hmm. you know, they're going to become, we're going to be their caretakers and the bill that's going to come with that. And, you know, I don't know what our healthcare system will provide for them in the next 10, 20 years, you know, as there's less and less funds going in or being utilized. So I think the main thing people have got to just take a step back and be like, Hey, what do we want out of life? Cause we spend more time, you know, I'm going to Hawaii in May. My wife was on the phone today for about two hours with our friends booking uh, hotels, uh, the transfer from the airport to our hotel, mm-hmm. all those things, you know, and uh, when was the last time her and I spent two hours talking and I'm in the industry, mm-hmm. but intimately talking about our goals in life, you know, not even financial goals, but just what we want. Mm-hmm. You know? And, um, you know, but we can spend two or three hours on a what's today a Tuesday morning planning a trip, but we can't take that same time to figure out what we want out of our life long term. And I, I think what it, and it's sometimes just avoidance behavior because people don't want to think that far ahead because it's not a rosy picture, right? Mm. I think I think that's massive. I think because in my head I was like, okay, what's he gonna say? Is it gonna be the common uh, <laughs> live below your means and and invest what's left over and things like that? But you know what? A lot of people are kind of going at life with their eyes closed. You know, they don't really have a, a target. You know, they kind of go with the flow. Next week, they hear of a new opportunity and they try to jump on that train. And if it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I think that's what, uh, like, what we do in our house is we have uh, every month we have kind of like a financial meeting. I literally have a financial meeting with my wife to look at like what's the game plan, and then at that time we also do like what do we want to do, right? What do we want to do in terms of vacations? What do we want to do in terms of the the stretch of the year? And to be completely honest, uh, I think people don't even plan the next day. You know, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. They're kind of like, okay, wake up, do this, do that. And that's the extent. Whereas I think, um, you know, when we're talking about, and when we get into the life insurance portion, we're talking about kind of, you know, some things that you can do uh, prior to, to kind of help yourself in terms of uh, developing your wealth. But at the same time, we're talking about what's the end goal? What's the end target? How do you want to pass on the wealth to your family and things like that, right? And I think uh, saying that you should know what you want out of life, having some goals and spending some time to hash that out, I think that's probably one of the best things that people can do. Because if I talk to some of the guys, like we had contractors over at the house doing renovations and I had to drop one of them off. And I'm like, hey, man, it's like, what's your plan? Like, you should, you know, you're doing this stuff and you're pretty good. And they drop you off and you do the work yourself. Like, you know, are you going to open up a tiling business yourself? And he's like, I never really thought about it. I just think about the next day, do my work. And Friday, I get to law the peg and drink, drink a drink. And then like kind of rinse and repeat. And if something opens up, but it's, you know, I even told him like, man, they drop you off and you're doing all the work. You can do all this. You have all the skills to, to, you know, do this stuff. But some, some people are kind of just like, you know, not looking into the future or even having a bit of a plan. So I think that's massive, man. And again, everyone's built differently as well. Mm-hmm. So we might be, you know, we're lucky that I'm assuming we all grew up with in a fairly good uh, family environment where, yeah, you know, we got slapped around as kids a little bit here and there, but it's predominantly a supportive environment <laughs> that pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, and I don't judge others because I, you, know, you never know what's going on in their home, mm-hmm. uh, whether when they're kids or now, you know, some, sometimes people have, you know, marriage issues or when their kids might be sick or, you know, so, uh, but again, I think first thing I do is everything is figure out what we want out of life. And it doesn't have to be a number at, you know, financial platform. I say at 90, you want this much and reverse engineer it. Mm-hmm. And these are the steps you got to get. Yeah. Like, yeah, that'll be kind of incorporated into your plan, but it really starts with, Hey, what do you guys want? Mm-hmm. Right? and you know like my wife and i do talk about that kind of stuff and we're like we're trying to figure out hey where do you want our kids to go to high school that's a big stress right now our son's three years away from high school he's in grade five and we're trying to figure out is hey where should he go mm-hmm. you know for academics just the overall environment athletics all that kind of stuff and um you know i'm not even thinking about you know doctor dentist engineer right yeah yeah <laughs> you know? but then also just coming back to the kids thing is planning for kids is also is we got to be on top of that. I know you have a young family as well as we got to kind of steer them, you know, find out what their talents are, what they like. Mm-hmm. And also we have an idea because we living born here. A lot of us is, Hey, what do you think, you know, what's going to be where trends are going to happen over the next five, 10, 20 years. And again, trends are changing, you know, on an annual basis. Uh, however, we got to kind of guide them because 
doing a BA in history like I did is like doing a high school degree nowadays. Mm -hmm. It brings no value. Yeah. Right. And um, so I don't want them going to university wasting five years of, you know, not really learning anything because again, history books, you know, you gotta, now I look back as who wrote these history books? It was their version of history. Yeah. Was it, was it the real history? And then also five years of unearned income because now if my kid at 20 decides to start his business, say as a Tyler, like the guy you dropped off the other day, from 20 to 25, he can work for someone else and then learn and go make six figures running his own tiling business. Mm -hmm. uh, so if my kid decides school's not for him, he can start at 20 doing that instead of 25 after university. So those five years of going to school, you're it's not just costing your tuition, it's also costing you maybe half a million dollars of unearned earnings because you lose that earning power those five years you were there. Fair enough. Yeah. Now you have a now you're 25 starting life. Pressure is building. I get married. I gotta buy a place. Whereas, you know, so I'm not too proud to sense that, hey, yeah, my wife and I both have degrees. She's a nurse and uh, I'm in the financial industry. But if my kid wants to start working right out of high school, I'll fully support him. Or if my daughter wants to do the same. And I think we have a responsibility as parents to make sure we kind of guide them. We can't just, hey, bar low rate, go study and <laughs> go read a book. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's, it's different now because we're born here. Our, you know, our parents had that excuse because they, they were just working two jobs. They didn't know any better. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that's, that's what I struggle with too, man. Like, like, like you said, blue collar parents, like they just understood work, work, work overtime, 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 right. If you get it, you're awesome. You're banking it. And I'm like, now I'm trying to learn the other side, the business side different. And it's hard because I can't, come home and ask those questions because they don't they don't have the answers they're still like put the hours in when i do an overtime shift at work i have to come home they're so proud and i'm just and i'm angry because i'm like oh i didn't want to do this but you know like it's it's different it's different man and that's like you said it perfectly like we know where we can guide them because they didn't know any better a good job back then was a good thing but now it's like a good job doesn't really matter because you need that extra income you need your money to work for you right and so, so it's still a good thing it's it just doesn't, like, it doesn't yeah, pay the bills or like it used that's to. the thing like it, yeah. And yeah you need that extra something on the side to get wherever you want to be depending on what your goals are unless you just want to bypass life and just yeah and think about it, like that's another thing is that makes the makes me work hard is knowing that you know what our grandparents probably went through during partition right oh, yeah. our parents come in here it'd be such a wasted life to be just above average so when i work you know like you know seven days a week sometimes i'm just like hey it's that's the least I could do. I'm not working hard. I don't need a pat in the back. It's just people have, you know, set the foundation for us to be out here and, you know, look yeah. at, you know, we always complain about little things here and there, but how lucky we live here in Metro 100%. Vancouver. 100%. Yeah. And I can get the stories of how they came here, like, yeah, and, and just how they set everything up. Like I, the stories my dad's told me, you're just, it, it humbles you, man. You're like, wow, I'm like, I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> no, totally. And then another funny story is uh just our parents' perception of hard work. Because uh, my parents think I'm unemployed, right? Because I work for myself. <laughs> and my, my, my younger brother, who works just as hard as me, great guy. And he works for the city. And, uh, you know, it's a lot more uh, laborious, you know, more, more blue collar. But my mom, you know, not, we live nearby now. We just moved to our new place. And, you know, she'll be like, oh, just drop off some milk here, right? Because she thinks I'm free. <laughs> You know, if I'm on the road, she'll call me because, you know, when you get my parents in their 70s, so in their 70s, they start, they start calling you a couple times a day, just all day, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm just driving. And, you know, she, but she thinks I'm just free because I don't have a real office or job because she thinks I'm just driving. And, <laughs> right? yeah. and I'm like, why don't you ask my brother? And he's like, oh, he's tired. He just came home from work. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, and, uh, but their perception is always going to be okay. Because yeah. that, that reminds when he comes home and dirty, it makes them yeah. proud because that's how they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. and then when I come over in my suit and tie and they're like, they're proud that I'm doing well, but at the same time, I feel, I feel like I disappointed them at their core. Like <laughs> this guy's too proper. Right. And, uh, but yeah, I was yeah. like, but they're the ones that told me, Bartla, right. Become a yeah, professional. Yeah. Yeah. And now that I'm one, they're kind of like disappointed. Like I wish, you know, you had, cause I'm useless around the house. So my parent, my dad's almost embarrassed. Like when they do rentals or little projects around the house or even yard work, they never call me because they think I'm so <laughs> which I am. And, uh, and, you know, for the longest time, it was embarrassing because everyone would put me down, but now it's worked in my favor because no one calls me for help. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I'll, I'll show up on the Sunday, you know, when they move, you know, when the job's done, I'll show up with the pizza and beer, right? And everyone loves me for that. And, uh, but uh, sorry, but I just kind of went sideways. No, no, all good, all good. This is awesome. Uh, so, okay. 
So let's say, let's do a hypothetical here. So let's say somebody's got, they want to retire a little bit earlier. Let's say before 65, let's say they want to retire 55 or 60 or something, a few years. And let's say right now they're in their thirties and they don't really have much of a financial education. So where should they start in your opinion, in terms of setting up for their future, making sure that they have a good retirement plan, maybe they have a kid or two and they want to make sure that their kids are set up well. In your opinion, you know, where should that person start? Maybe in terms of how they start to get education, should they talk to somebody first, read some books? Like where would you start if you were kind of doing this right now and you're in your thirties? The first thing I would do is find, go talk to individuals in your network who have, who are happy with their advisor. Because uh, a lot of times we just jump into whoever someone refers us or mentions. Or in our community, you know, we have like, we have a hundred mortgage brokers, a hundred realtors, a hundred insurance people in our family network. Mm -hmm. So we just go to the person that's closest to us in terms of relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I would suggest is um, first find that individual, find an advisor can guide you, who's not going to be pushy and work because your whole life you worked hard to get a job or start a business and start a family, maybe buy a home and you work so hard to get that point and it's just like when you start thinking about financial planning you're already exhausted by the time you hit your early 30s mm -hmm. the 30s is the hardest decade of your life because you're trying to figure it out mm -hmm. right you know marriage home kids all that kind of stuff and um and you need advisors just kind of hold your hand and let you know first hey, everything's gonna be okay and that advisor is not going to be throwing numbers down your throat mm -hmm. <laughs> oh you got big terms or acronyms you know, and uh, really handhold you. So even like, you know, when we first chatted, you know, many, many years ago, we never talked, we talked a little bit about product, but just kind of figure out, hey, what you're trying to look to do. And, you know, sometimes the timing's not right. And, you know, that's how, that's been my approach. So I'm kind of giving an example of how I would approach it and how I would have been appreciative if I had someone like that, say if I was still in trucking and my wife's a nurse, I would have appreciated someone who would have held my hand mm -hmm. just like, hey, you know, and spent the time because you're not going to get that at the bank. Uh, unfortunately, because I keep messing up, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, again, it's not, and say I have a lot of family members and friends, and actually business partners I work with at the bank. But thing is, they have their own thing. They got to just sell product. Because that's, that's what happened. Like, I mean, I've gone a couple times, a bunch of different ones. Then you go in and you're looking for an answer or some guidance, and they're like, "Yeah, you're fine. Just do this." And I'm like, "That's not no. Like, that's not what I'm looking for here." And again, in their defense, they're only limited to that one line of product yeah. offering or whatever yeah, they work. You know, and. Uh, and the challenge there is when you go back the next time, there's someone new there. Yeah. So you, they don't know your story or history. Yeah. Um, so first thing to do is you got to find a reputable advisor who's, who can spend an hour or two with you and not sell you anything. Yeah. Which is very hard to find because, you know, when I see someone, I'm thinking, okay, as long as they can potentially become a client in the next five years, it's worth my time. Mm -hmm. And people just feel comfortable at, at ease. And um, so that would be the first step in there. Because, and then I got to assume some hypotheticals. Hey, let's just say they got two kids. They got two jobs that collectively maybe pay 150 grand a year. Have a home. Mortgages, maybe six, seven grand a month. Car payments and all that. That's a typical family. Mm -hmm. Maybe a set of parents living at home. Mm -hmm. Basement suite rented out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, one spouse has benefits and pension at work. The other one doesn't. So let's assume all that. Then we first sit down with them and just be like, Hey, you know, like again, comes back to the same thing. So if you can repeat your question, like, I want to make sure I'm not going, um, off topic here, but if you could just repeat your question. You yeah, yeah. So it was more so in terms of like, let's say, for example, you have somebody that's in their thirties, they were looking to retire a little bit earlier. Like, let's say they want to re retire around in their 60s, or, you know, maybe earlier than that. They have two kids. They want to be set up for the future, you know, to be set for their retirement, but yeah. at the same time, still have some flexibility within their life. Because a lot of our discussions have been, hey, I understand that I could set this up towards the end. But we have a lot of like, you know, yeah. you know, God willing and stuff like everything goes well. We got a nice long life. Um you know, we want to enjoy those years as well, you know, with some, with some financial freedom and time. So, you know, how would you kind of like help that person or guide that person in terms of like reaching that goal? So, 
I think we'll simplify it and, you know, first of all, identify number one is what's important to them, right? You know, and the second thing is at a macro level is show them that, hey, you know, your financial plan is almost like, say, like a two-story home, right? There's a foundation, your main floor, and the top floor. I mean, some people in our community have four floors, but let's just use two. <laughs> the fund. And what people don't see is if no one's ever going to comment, come into your home and say, hey, man, you got such a beautiful foundation to your home because they can't see it. Mm-hmm. And your financial plan also has a foundation, which includes things like having a will, power of attorney, health care directive, um, insurance. I love the fact that people hate buying insurance because it's such a tough industry to crack. Right, because you have to really have a heart to heart. It's not numbers you're speaking; you're speaking to uh, emotions. And the good thing is, if you don't have a foundation, that house will crumble. Doesn't matter how much you have saved in your RSP, TFSAs, or rental income. If that foundation is not there to a home, that home will crumble. Just like your financial plan, if one spouse passes away, right, it's a game changer. Or if someone has um, gets critical, has cancer, game changer, and the reason I'm so passionate, we'll I don't know if we'll talk about it later on, but the reason I'm so passionate about insurance is I've seen people pass away at a young age or, you know, some, the closest people in my family have had cancer and heart attacks in their early 40s. And so when I talk about it, I use their examples because I don't want the person I'm talking to go through the same experience that my loved ones went through. And because if you don't have insurance today, you're fa- and say one spouse passes away, your kids are set back a whole generation because it's so expensive to live here. Mm-hmm. If something happened to my dad in the 80s, guess what? My two, my mom, my two mom, me, my mom's older brothers would have been like, here, here's 50 grand from each of them. Mm-hmm. Pay off your $100,000 mortgage and you live mortgage free and mom would work part time, work, would work at a factory and pay some of the bills. We rent out a suite then, right? Mm-hmm. First of all, no one's got money saved in savings today like they did back in the 80s. And you guys probably 90s in your example, you guys are younger than I. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but again, how many people have a will? Very few. It's not fun to talk about. Uh, power of attorney. You know, if something happens to me, who's gonna make my financial decisions on my behalf? Mm-hmm. If I'm on life support, who's gonna make the decision, you know, pull the plug? One, one kid might be like, oh, you know, I want dad to be alive. Another kid might be like, no, no, let him go. He suffered enough. So all these documents are, cause they're not there just, they're really to preserve the family unit because they know, okay, this is what dad or mom wanted for us. And because we've seen infighting from our clients and just from my experiences, my colleagues with their clients is siblings, you know, start having relationships fall apart, you know, when parents get sick. Mm-hmm. So again, people always think, oh, you know, you're probably trying to sell us a million dollar portfolio or this huge insurance policy. No, we want to make sure that just because what good is it if I, if I sold one of you guys, you know, an insurance policy and something happens in a couple of years where you can't afford the premiums anymore. You know, you have a stroke. And again, majority of my clients are Indo-Canadian is we're not the healthiest men. We're not the healthiest species out there. You know, we, we for some reason, we think we're better than we are. We're macho and yeah. I, I used to be a good athlete, you know, yeah. when I was 10 years old, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if you, look at, if you look at our diet or you look at our, you know, our pantry, it's all chocolate chip cookies and potato chips. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and our parents, you know, like our moms, you know, making bronte every day when we live at home or uh, my mom will come over, drop off like a stack of bronte. <laughs> and then she'll rub my belly. She's like, yeah, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you can't. It's like, it's like a puppy, you know, you're feeding them, teasing them with some food. I'm just like, why are you? And she'll drop off like, you know, like cake and stuff for the kids. But if it's sitting in my house, I'm going to go to town, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, coming back to... So insurance, no one likes to talk about insurance because it's not sexy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the only time people jump at buying insurance is when they've had a negative experience in their family, losing a loved one or someone having cancer or someone, I remember um, one of my judges, his, he's a taxi driver, his, uh, his buddy got cancer. Mm-hmm. I got paid $200,000 in a critical illness claim 20 years ago. The whole fleet ended up buying critical illness insurance from that advisor at RBC because they all wanted to cash in now, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, you know, it's a copycat industry, uh, community. You know, we do what other people do. That's but, the best way to say it. Yeah, again, everything, like insurance, weddings, trips, cars, 
I remember growing up, everyone had the same Toyota minivan in my ex family, ex immediate and extended. Every color, this Toyota one, it's a funny looking van as well. And, um, but like Sunny said, it's copycat because if one person does it, everyone else does it, right? And, uh, but again, start with the foundation. Everyone wants to jump onto the second floor and, you know, have this great master bathroom. You know, I'm just trying to use a home analogy because our community can relate to it or have this great kitchen, you know, with a huge island, which mm -hmm. is nice. It's like having a great investment portfolio. But guess what? You want to make sure that your foundation is strong, that it can hold up your investments. And then when you get in the main floor, you know, we always think, oh, hey, you know, we've always been trained RSPs are the way to go. RESPs for the kids or TFSA, which has come out in the last decade plus, or a pension. And again, all those things are great. You know, saving, just saving alone is important. Um, but how many people have money sitting in their bank account? Like an emergency fund, just... Hey, if something happens, if I lose my job next three months, if I have no income coming in from work, do I have enough money in my, you know, to pay my bills, you know, my three month over the next three month period? Who's got that? It's, it's boring. It's not sexy. People don't do that. And then also um, tax planning. Make sure you have a good accountant that works with your advisor, mm. that works with your lawyer. Because right now we have a lawyer telling you something, accountant telling you something, uh, insurance person trying to sell you something, your banker trying to sell you something. No one's collaborating. So even in our practice, we kind of become the quarterback of you know handling our clients' affairs, where we communicate, you know, CC each other, and, and the client feels at ease, like, hey, these guys are taking care of everything for me, and because um, everyone's got to be on the same page, because all those pieces, you know, are part of the puzzle. They got to match. They got to fit in. You know, you can't have random pieces there, because then you can't have a full puzzle, and. Uh, so, but tax efficiency is very important because I think we've talked about in the past is RSPs are great gross amount, but when you hit retirement, you're going to be losing 30 to 60% of that value because it's going to go to tax. And people are like, well, I'm not going to be making that much money. Yeah, you might not be making that much money, but cost of living today is X amount. Just basic 3% inflation in the next 20 to 25 years, your cost of living is going to be double. So if it costs you hundred grand to run your household today, which may be high or low for some individuals, but it's going to cost you $200,000 to run that same household 20 to 25 years from now because everything's going to be more expensive. So you're going to have to take more money out of your RSPs. Mm -hmm. And that's going to put you in the higher tax bracket because a $200,000 income is going to put you in a 45% plus tax bracket. And the way government's spending right now, it doesn't matter if it's liberals, NDP, or conservatives, everyone's spending a ton of money, is if you're in the higher tax bracket, you're going to be paying maybe close to 60% 25 years from now. Because we're already in the low 50s, the highest marginal tax bracket. So you also got to look at it as, hey, what I'm saving is, do I just blindly go to the bank? Buy GICs there, at, you know, whatever, 3 4%, and buy my RSPs or TFSA? Or do I sit with a planner who goes over every option, does a needs analysis, brings up the financial calculators? And we use all those tools, but really simplify it, you know, so our clients can see it and like no one, you know, or if you're a business owner as well, there's so many benefits of being a business owner is work with your account and look at, you know, the tax perspective involved of saving through your corporation. Does it make sense? Right. And um, so, but again, short story long, yeah. <laughs> um, you got to focus on that foundation. If that's, if your listeners look at, listen to this over the next year, just solidify your foundation. Go to an advisor, a lawyer, your accountant, talk to them. Like, hey, I need a will. I need my power of attorney taken care of. If Because I've seen old people when they get sick at the hospital. If I'm on life support and I know I'm going to be a vegetable or just, you know, a fraction of myself coming out if I were to survive, I'd want them to pull the plug because I don't want, I don't want to be a burden on my family. Because I've seen it with parents and grandparents, you know, when they're sick, you know, you got to allocate all your resources. It takes up so much out of your family. And because our community is all about family, we're going to be at the hospital every day, or we're going to have two people taking care of a grandparent at home. Mm -hmm. And it affects your quality of life. And I would never want to put that burden on my, on my kids, you know, because it's going to, you know, hold them back. And uh, so again, build up uh, will, if you're a business owner, corporate will, power attorney, healthcare directive, life insurance, critical illness insurance, disability insurance. Uh, make sure you have all that stuff taken care of before you start looking at all the investment stuff. Okay. That's good. That's great advice. Um, it's I not think, sexy. 
Oh yeah. Uh, which is a magic pill that we could take and <laughs> fix all our problems. But it's really generic. Yeah, really sitting down and taking care of this stuff, man. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. see it all the time, like you say, like I'm a nurse myself, so I see the stuff that goes on, man. Like that means just when the things hit the fan and people are sick or you just see what happens amongst the families. Siblings start fighting. They stop talking, and it's just—it's crazy, man. Worse, man. Yeah. yeah. Fight over properties and things like that. You're just like, holy dude! Like this person's dying. You guys are just all you guys care about is like. Uh, but crazy. there, there's like a you know even like on the other side of that. So for example, like that's the arguments of what's going to happen in terms of like after they pass away, land in India, land here, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like. um if you have all that dealt with prior to, it eliminates a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, that's what and, we do. And uh, another thing that we've been looking at um, and what we've discussed with Sim, which I actually wanted to bring up and talk about it, is, you know, people are looking at setting up their kids for the future, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially the parents that listen to the podcast or, you know, even if you're like an uncle or aunt to some of, you know, you, you're wondering like, hey, you know, how can I set up my nieces and nephews better, right? And I've always looked at, tax-free savings accounts, stocks and bonds, you know how volatile it can be. Even if you're an investor in low-cost index funds, it's still going to go down at times. It's still going to go up at times, right? But, you know, we talked about some of the, we, we don't have to get into specifics about the products, but this is one thing that I did want to bring up. And it was some of these wealth generating type products for your kids when they're young and you start off kind of building it when they're young. Cause we're always talking about you know, how are we going to pay for, you know, how are we going to help them with their weddings? You know, how are we going to help them with their down payment on a house, especially from now to 25 years from now or whatever, you know, how can we do that? You could obviously save, but um, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. Some people, like you said, some people are barely making it by right now. So what are some things that um, people can do? Maybe they have some young kids, you know, we're talking about the uh, wealth generation, you know, million dollar baby, um, policy so maybe like in your opinion what do you think you know for maybe the parents that are looking at hey how can i set my kids up and help them to create some sort of like generational wealth you know yeah. you know obviously it's changing right sam like you always say like hey listen you know you're never talking in absolutes with us which is what I, why i love it because they'll be like hey we'll have to reassess because new yeah. products come things change and, and that's awesome because like with us personally we've had people even in our family that had a policy set it and forget it and down the road, they're like, you know, if you added this on at that time, it would have been beneficial. But now they're looking at it towards the end and they're like, oh, you know, at the time it was great. But compared to some of the things that are happening now, you know, it's not as great. So, you know, maybe so, if you could elaborate a little bit on those policies yeah. and what you think. I'm passionate about children's planning because uh, we have two kids and a lot of my friends are having kids and we're having these discussions and planning for your kids is a very personal decision. You know, there's no right or wrong when it comes to saving for their future. But uh, the three main areas I look at is, um, you know, like a lot of us, we want to make sure our kids get an education post-secondary, right? And we can save up for that. And, uh, you know, our ESP programs are very popular there. Uh, my wife's been a nurse at Sir Memorial for over 20 years. So for her, it was uh, critical illness insurance for kids because she's been in hospital rooms where kids passed away or gotten really sick and you know where the parents probably have to quit their job for full-time care of the kid for the next five ten years and she goes if anything ever happened to my kids i want to make sure we have a critical illness policy not that they're going to get sick but you know just to plan for it in case they do and then my job is really about wealth creation and uh, a whole life policy is a great policy for lo creating long-term wealth for um, our children's generation you know and, um, you know, the question I always ask people is what's more important is, is saving up tuition for your kids or do you want to create wealth for your kids? And whatever the parents decide, we move forward with that. You know, you laid out there and, uh, and I'm, I'm a huge believer in critical illness insurance because everyone's always thinking, even in life insurance industry, everyone's always talking about life insurance. There's a much greater probability five, six times that you're going to have, a, you know, heart attack, stroke, or cancer than prematurely passing away statistically speaking. So as a planner, I have to plan for that. And I think our generation gets it because they're seeing a lot of it happen now. You know, we're living longer lives, but not necessarily healthier lives. And Sonny, you probably see a lot of your patients there 
you know, not the healthiest. It's not the healthiest people walking in, right? Uh, oh, man. And I'm in the home health now too, right? So like I'm seeing a whole different area of what I've seen before. And like you said earlier about the whole, our parents getting older and I'm seeing kids, like daughters, sons just burnt out. And they don't want to put their care, the parents in a care home because cultural reasons, you know, yeah. like the politics, look, what are people going to say? This yeah. and that, you put your kid. And honestly, I'm like, it, it's crazy, man. Like, we go in every day and yeah, well, I'm with the government and whatever, we go in, whatever, right? But at the end of the day, it's bare minimum. Nah, no, it isn't. We're like, we always assume, oh, the government's going to take care of us and the government only has so many resources themselves. What's QID four times a day? What's an hour, four hours a day? Nah. Honestly, if somebody that's a full care, someone to come in the morning for 15 minutes, sure, they'll get them ready. I'm going to come in at lunch, maybe change their pad, come in again during dinner time, maybe feed them. But you're still like how many hours, 20 hours of the day, almost, right? That you install on them. And even if you put them in a home, how expensive they are. Man. Like they're, it's insane. Like it's not cheap. And it's scary because our parents aren't ready. They're not. So the thing is when we talk to our clients is, hey, like save up for your retirement, portion of your retirement is going to be taking care of your parents. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like and, my parents aren't ready. Like, I got my parents myself and like, it's, yeah. it's freaks me out, man. Cause you know, like, and we're, and we're going we're to figure it, we we're gonna have to figure it out because you know, they've raised us and I don't yeah. think any of us could sleep at night knowing that we can't take care of our parents. And, uh, and the other thing is, um, yeah, we got to get rid of those cultural taboos because it's not right for 75 year olds to be taking care of 95 year olds at home. No. <laughs> That's and then so I just have that chat with my parents, you know, like they've been slaving away here working in Canada for about, I mean, my mom over 50 years, just until she retired recently. Yeah. And uh, there's no reason for her, she should be in retirement, not taking care of you know her elders. And yeah. but there's so much societal pressure. But now that we actually went through that and people saw how much uh, it helped taking care of my grandmother, everyone, you know, it's usually the first or two to market. Yeah. You know, it happens to them and then every, or, you know, yeah, everybody follows. Man. Everyone's like, oh, this is good. The monkey see, monkey do, literally, man. It's yeah. like, yeah, literally. <laughs> it's just our culture, man. It's like one person does it. Oh, okay. Now they'll start following. Like, we moved like Clayton Heights uh, in 2016. Trying to get that to happen was impossible. But then you're cutting oh, out a little bit, Sonny. So over there. Yeah. Now we can go that way. <laughs> like, why does it matter if it's not the, sorry is it better now uh oh, no, no this, this no, okay it's good okay now i think you're back i don't know something was happens in the evening man maybe i had basement people move in and uh tell this came to set up the internet and ever since that guy came i, so I don't know what's happened to ours <laughs> like <laughs> he did something to it and like even though they tell you it's your connection i gotta call these guys like something's been going weird man yeah so, uh, um the next few questions, we call it a speed round. So it's just oh, nothing sorry, to just, do with the actual conversation, but it's just... Thank you. Uh, if I could much. just circle back to that one thing regarding the million dollar policy here, I, I kind of sidetracked it. But, yeah, but, yeah. You know, when I first started bringing it up, people were like, oh, I don't want to get life insurance to my kids because it was like taboo, uh, you know, affiliated. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, but it's really a wealth creation product. And when we buy life insurance, whole life insurance for ourselves, you know, I'm 46 now majority of my premium is going towards the cost of insurance. And my runway as a 46 year old, if I had life expectancy is probably about 40 years. So there's not gonna be much growth there. Yeah. Whereas our kids, a large portion of their premium is going towards the investment portion of these whole life policies. Mm -hmm. Simplify you know, how the structure works, but they got a 70, 80 year window. Yeah. So, you know, like, and people see the value in this because now business owners see what whole life does for them corporate life insurance uh, or, you know, and they see that for themselves and they're like, wow, what if we do this for our kids? And they put a fraction of what they put for themselves and for their kids. Well, some of these people are putting in 10 grand a year for their kids policies and the cash value of retirement for some of these policies, are, you know, uh, like $5 million and they pay for 20 years and the numbers just keep creeping up. So again, we got to start, especially our generation, we have no excuses not to plan because yeah. we have access to all the resources, whether it be through financial institutions yeah. or uh, independent advisors and get informed and make the decision that sits right with you. 
Yeah. If you feel uncomfortable buying a life insurance policy for your children, buy some RESPs. Yeah. Right. If you feel like, hey, you know what? Uh, I need some critical illness insurance because we have family history. Get your kids a quarter million dollar policy today. So that way, when I when I put away, um, you know, we put a lot of money for our kids planning. But the way I look at it, I say, if I'm putting 10, away, 10 grand away a year into my kids' plans, it's 10 grand going out. It's actually, I'm saving them about 50 grand because if they try to this, mimic the same products when they're 40 years old, it's going to cost them about 50 grand. Yeah. To do, and they're not going to do it because that's like, you know, a one-year salary for a lot of people, right? So, um, but let's move on to the speed round. Yeah, well, before you continue. So I think uh, I think it's super important that the, we're just kind of going like a, on a surface level on some of these topics. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, for, for sure. so for example, like uh, when Sim's talking about this wealth generation stuff, there's a lot more to it. There's a uh, cash value that gets generated. There's leverage potential. Yeah. So I think it's probably going to be better for people listening. Like, okay, first of all, if you don't know who to talk to, I always treat any kind of like any kind of thing like you're working with a contractor, get three opinions. So we have Sam here. I think uh, people should just, you know, book a call, speak to Sam, and then maybe two other people just to get an idea and get some no more knowledge about like how this stuff works. Because some of the wealthiest families or the wealthiest family in the world, a lot of their wealth is in life insurance policies for that generational wealth. So I, I think uh, just to look at that as an avenue of not just, oh, when I pass away, like, who cares? Why would I want life insurance? You know, when I, you know, I'm not going to see it till I die. So what's the point? You know, yeah, my family's going to be okay, but, you know, I'll just give them my house or something like that, right? I think uh, there's more to these things than people people know. So what what's a, what's an hour conversation with somebody that's been doing it for like, you know, 18, 19 years already? They're going to be able to just kind of give you so much knowledge in that span of an hour. So just want to get that out there. Um, but I think it's important because I, I, me and Sonny were both like ignorant to RESPs. We were talking about like, is it worth it? Is it not? So Sonny was kind of leaning into it and I was hard against it. Like, forget it. They can't use it if they, um, they like, you know, if they put money into it, they, you know, you lose that money. And then when I spoke to you, you're like, well, that's not necessarily true. You know, if I they decide it. not to go, what's that? I did it. Oh, you got it? We did it for a CC. Yeah. yeah. So Sim was saying that like, you know, I was going under the impression that it's like, you're really not going to get any of the money back uh, if you don't utilize or the kids decide hey you know i actually don't want to get a degree i actually want to be a business person or so on and so yeah. forth but sim also was saying that educational stuff can change too so you could actually get to a point where it's like hey um trades are now included yeah, yeah, yeah. right so it, it, can, it can change things up quite a bit the only i would say is you know get um, an independent resp um where you control have control over uh, the definitions mm -hmm. and historically a lot of RESP plans have been restricted. So you can only use them for certain instances, certain schools or certain programs or full-time. Uh, it's become a little bit more flexible now. And I think as the school system gets a little bit more diverse, uh, you know, online, different designations like trades. Yeah. Uh, so, but again, as long as you're saving, I tell people whatever, you, don't worry so much about what I'm saving in, just start saving, build up those habits because we're not savers, we're spenders as a society, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, uh, that one hour call is at my expense. Um, so sometimes people are worried about talking to someone because they go, how much does it cost, right? Mm -hmm. We're not lawyers here. You know, that one hour call will be at our expense. You, you don't even have to leave your house. You yeah. can get on a Zoom <laughs> link, sit in your couch, have your, your drink or your food, and you can just talk on, on like before, before it was a pain in the ass. Oh, I got to get changed. I got to put on my jeans. I got to get in the car, drive on over. And you know what though? Uh, there are people that actually enjoy that person to person connection, but it, you know, there's no excuses nowadays. Cause that's what we did. I said, Hey Sam, I'm busy, man. Can we just hop on a zoom call? And you know, and same thing with one of my buddies, same thing. He's like, I've been looking into it and um, you know, I think he probably saw you in person because he's that type of person. So well, again, sometimes um, when you start talking nitty gritty, certain numbers, mm -hmm. uh, cer cer certain things you want uh, come across better in person and you can ask those questions. And uh, uh, especially someone I don't know, I like, cause again, for me, it's, I want, I want it to be a relationship where, you know, I can serve this family for the next 25 years and I want to make sure it's the right fit for them and for me. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we're busy as two. Yeah. You know, it, used to, it used to be that point where when you start, you'll take on any client. 
But now you're like, hey, I'm taking away time for my family, my kids, my aging parents, mm -hmm. my hobbies. Uh, I want to make sure if I'm going to be spending some time with a client, somebody enjoy spending time with. Absolutely. And um, so, but yeah, like I said, it's at, at our expense. We'll, you know, whatever, however we can help people. And um, I don't know we're going to speed around, but um, also just be mindful of estate planning as well. Uh, you know, because there's going to be huge, I mean, billions of dollars, you know, going to the government in terms of wealth transfer from our community over the next few decades. Uh, so that's a conversation people start having with their advisor, uh, their accountant and lawyer as well. Yeah, this, that's a, like, you know, we, we only we are going to have limited time, you know, because we don't so, want this to be like thing. a three, three hour thing. I, I, I want to be respectful of your time. But like even estate planning is massive because people people think like, oh, no, my, my family is going to get the house. But the truth is actually in terms of capital gains, you're going to pay. And even if you try to play the, shen uh, the shenanigans of trying to like transfer the title over, there's a yeah. lot of things that can go wrong, right? Audits can happen. So it's not that it's not that clear cut. So definitely for that. But Sonny, let's hit it with the speed round for, for Sim. So uh, basically a speed round is just going to be a series of questions. Um, you can allow, if you feel, feel free to elaborate on some of the questions, but you know, they're kind of just like quick, you know, one word, two word answers. But if you feel like, Hey, this is a good topic. Let me talk about it. Feel free to do so. You're not going to stop me. Are you? What's that? You're not going to try to stop me. Are you? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. There's some decent ones. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so first question, text or phone call? Depends on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends on the person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, exactly. It depends on who it is, right? Uh, favorite day of the week? Ooh. Oh, man. Um, uh, Monday morning, man. Yeah. Now, it never used to be when I was in school. <laughs> It's always yeah. Fridays, right? Because <laughs> now you got your routine. So Monday morning, everything goes back to normal because the weekends yeah. are crazy with kids and family. Yeah. Uh, favorite city in Canada besides where you live? Uh, Victoria. Yeah. Mine's beautiful. Good. Like, uh, I would love to live there. So peaceful, man. Like, yeah. I love it. You just walk around. And it's just, yeah, it's nice. We're getting old, man, when we start saying Victoria, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Um, last, but my, mind you, I'm not going there unless I can learn how to swim. Okay. <laughs> uh, last song you downloaded. Last song I downloaded was um, a song by Alicia Cara, a Canadian singer from Toronto. It's called Scars to My Beautiful because my daughter, we went on a Valentine's Day dance. She's in grade two. Mm, okay. uh, on Saturday night, we went to dance and on the way home, she's like, Dad, this is my favorite song. And oh. I downloaded it and it's such a, the lyrics are powerful. And I was just like, I listened to it, I get emotional because the fact that my two, my grade two, my seven year olds actually listen to the lyrics of a yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Canadian artist, just a, a great artist. And if you look her up, you'll recognize her, uh, Alicia Cara. Um, at what age do you want to retire? Uh, until physically I can't do this anymore or mentally because my job is not laborious, but uh, you know, I, I started when I was 28. I told myself I'm going to work till 76, like a 48 minute basketball game. Each year is a minute. <laughs> so I feel like I'm in the middle of the second quarter right now. <laughs> and, uh, and also in our industry, you make my mentors who are in their seventies are making more money than they've ever made in their forties and fifties, just because your clientele uh, their net worth is typically a lot larger. And uh, so 76. Favorite childhood TV show or movie? Three's Company, man. I don't know if you guys ever watched it. Three's Company? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I haven't watched it, it but I'm familiar with it. Great. Well, Three's Company, the original Transformers cartoon. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. And any wrestling from the 80s till today. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yes, I can agree with that. Um, if money wasn't an issue, where would you travel to um, or your dream destination? If money wasn't an issue, um, man, um, I'm a homebody. Like I've traveled everywhere. Um, What's your favorite place you've been to then? Yeah, let's ask that then. Um, I would say uh, Greece. I agree, man. Uh, That's where we went on our honeymoon, uh, my wife and I, and 
Yeah, we love it. The two places yeah. everyone says, man, like I think everyone when people travel, the two responses I get that people would go back to no question is either Hawaii or Greece. Yeah. And we're doing our first ever Hawaii trip this year. Yeah, I heard anyway, everyone that goes there the first time, they're like, that's it. Like they don't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see if that changes you too. <laughs> um, if you're a reader, what are your top three books that you would recommend to the audience and why? Um so I'll just, again, it, it's, it's all how it, um, these books are received to each individual. So for me, one book I read, and it was 177 chapters. It's called 177 uh, Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class, written by Stephen Siebold. Each chapter is one page. So the book is 177 pages. And each page was like a slap to the face. Because mm. you're reading it, it takes away all your excuses in life. And if you're self-driven, you know, we love to make excuses for ourselves. We're going to go through a tough point in life. I, I, I wrote it down. Don't worry. Oh, you did? I'll send it to you. I'm, I'm making notes of this stuff because I'm a big reader too. And I'm just looking, man. Um, sorry. I, swore, but I, I usually read, like I got over 200 books here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's also you outgrow certain books yeah, because you're like at that moment it meant a lot. And then now you look back, like that was kind of a cheesy book. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other books actually are more meaningful. Um, so I'm man, I love reading It noise. Like my wife thinks I read cause I'm trying to act all high class and stuff. I'm like, no, <laughs> I actually love reading. So when we go to Hawaii, she's probably like, let's go here. And I'm like, no, I just want to sit here and just read. Yeah, yeah. Soak in the sun rays, put my feet in the sand which is supposed to be healthy for you, right? Connect with the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but that's the one, I think it was the first one which really made me like, oh, like, wow. And then um, there's a few biographies. I don't know if you know the basketball player, Jerry West from the Lakers. Mm. Uh, you know, he's a little NBA logo. Yep. He's got his own biography. And for me, that was really resonating with me just because he likes to beat himself up mentally. He's very mm -hmm. hard on himself. And I think a lot of us are in the quiet times. We don't really show it to our wives. All our, we internalize a lot of our stress because we don't want other people to get stressed, maybe our parents or our wives and stuff. And he's been through so many highs and lows in his life and his trajectory. Mind you, it's in basketball. He's one of the greatest players of all time. But, you know, I look at his trajectory and I kind of like look at how it relates to me. And uh, so his biography is very, very powerful as well, right? Okay. And then what about for the last book? Let's, let's keep it financial. What would you say like financially was a good book for you? Man, I used to read these. See, a lot of these books are so basic. Yeah. But they connect. So um, um, what was David Chilton's book? Um, next door, millionaire next door. No. David Chilton had a book. Um, he's a hilarious guy too. I want to look up his. Uh, Let me see if I. Can do I don't want to leave the screen here, but I have all. Uh, no, all good, all good. You can. Did you hear that toy playing in the background? No, no. Okay. So, is it the is it the wealthy barber? Yeah, wealthy barber. So I liked it because he's hilarious, and I don't know you guys. I love dumb jokes. Like I love dumb stuff. My wife, my wife's like that too. <laughs> so it annoys my wife because she's like, why are you laughing? I'm just like, I love, you know, like, so, but again, he simplifies things and we're always trying to, because when I look at our industry, it's evolved. So a lot of stuff is not relevant today. Mm -hmm. And and there's some technical books out there and stuff that, you know, like about tax and stuff. I wouldn't recommend that to anyone, but I think that the wealthy bar would be a good place to start. And, uh, and he's become a celebrity as well uh, in the mainstream David Chilton has. And he's just self-deprecating, really funny, mm -hmm. but really, really smart as well. But he takes the message and really simplifies it, which I think is important because a lot of people don't step into the financial planning space as clients because they're so overwhelmed. Yep. yep. And so, so that, the Jerry West biography and uh, the Stephen Siebold book. And there's probably 20 other ones that I love, like Bret Hart's biography I saw right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Hitman. <laughs> it's, 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 a wrestling um, junkie, right? <laughs> if, if you're, you know, if you're a reader, it's really, really hard when somebody asks you that question of like top three books. Like usually a, each book is like kind of like a story or it's like speaking to you, you know what I mean? So it's, it's at the time, 
it might be the greatest thing for you. And then in hindsight, you're like, uh, you know, maybe not so much anymore. Maybe at that time it was, but it changes, right? Yeah. Like uh, I just finished reading blue ocean strategy, um, which is a really good book, but it didn't really resonate with me as much compared to like some of my friends, like, Oh, this is the greatest book. And I would just highlight the one or two points in each chapter that connected with me. And, um, but again, at the same time, I was like, man, I can't wait to finish this book. I just want to get it done. Yeah. Put, yeah. put it on the mantle, right? <laughs> yeah. I, and that's another thing too. It's not blasphemy for you to highlight or write in books. Like a lot it's of people, like, people are like, go write in it. <laughs> Pardon me? Make sure it's your own book though. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But like, I, I remember I'm like, oh, there was a part in this book. I can't find it. And then I just put a tab there now. And it's like so easy for me to just like, boom open it up and it's a highlighted for that specific point right so you can refer back to it sorry go ahead sonny um next question what was a major light bulb moment for you when you first started to get educated on personal finance or life insurance so for me it's it's been built in my dna because my dad had a lot of friends in the industry from the 80s and you'd always see all these individuals come in and um uncles <laughs> You know, and, and you, you're stuck there on a summer night. Dad's like, come sit in the kitchen table. They're having a bag, right? Yeah. And selling life insurance. I got stuck there as being the older son. But in my passion was just, you know, when you care about people and you see the value that you can bring to the marketplace, along with, I look as a career, but also the impact I can make in people's lives. And, um, you know, I think I told you Tinder this, but I, I sold over a billion dollars of life insurance. And, you know, for me, I take a lot of pride in that being like a local, my own personal economic stimulation program. You know, everyone's looking for government handouts. I was like, hey, man, I'm going to go out there and make sure I make an impact in my community. Yeah. And it was just having a couple of good mentors uh, that really, you know, that took my excuses away from me. And there's an Indian fellow who passed away and um, a few years back, but he's the one who kind of took me in and just kind of helped elevate me, you know, in terms of believing in me, right? And so there's no really one moment, Sonny, but it was just stepping into the industry and finding out the impact I could make. And then once, uh, you know, I just saw the difference we could make, uh, you know, just started working hard. And, uh, you know, and the goal is now to grow that to $2 billion portfolio where, you know, we're making a difference because if something happens locally, you know, like millions of dollars are going back into the community when people get sick or unfortunately pass away. And I won't feel good about it, but I'm glad that I sat there with those family members and put those policies together. And because that's going to be life-changing for future generations, right? Mm -hmm. And um, leading with that question, uh, how you said you had mentors, who is your favorite person or figure in the industry? For, sorry, favorite? Favorite person or, or figure in the industry that you're in? Like your... So the first person that spoke to me, uh, he's in the personal development space, is uh, Ed Milet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Oh, yeah, but, I know the name. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2005, um, I heard him speak and it really got me out of that employee mindset. I kind of, you spoke to me, you know, just uh, you always connect with that one person and it just made me realize, okay, hey, I can offer more than just being an employee or just being more than being above average. And, you know, it still took me a decade after that to kind of, you know, get successful. But that was the first time I felt like I was. I felt like I was always confined to, in this little box because I didn't want to disappoint my parents mm -hmm. and others around, you know, your network. And it was the first time I felt like stepping out of that box. And, um, and then even the business side, um, you know, we're always worried about what people might say, Yeah. Uh, but I love Gary Vaynerchuk because he's like <laughs> us and swears a lot. Gary. And, yeah. So, uh, you know, I remember when he wrote his first book over a decade ago and even when he was here, I had a chance to hang out with him in Vancouver a few years ago before COVID and uh, down to earth, hard worker works seven days a week just like us and blue collar sports junkie mm -hmm. so just seeing people that you can kind of connect with yeah. and i was like hey you know i see a little bit of myself in that person he's just a year older than myself and so those are two people and again sometimes you get annoyed because you hear their message so often you shut them off for three months and then you'll be doing paperwork and some new material it, comes man. out it just resonates with you gets you fired up again and uh, but those are two that have really never disappointed me because uh you know the messaging has always been on point for me it's funny he said that like the, you get annoyed like even myself when i have people around me that 
I was being mentored by whatnot, it, that it got annoying to the point that the stuff they would say, but it was repetitive. And it was like, dude, I know, I know that you, but then that is what needs to be done. It's yeah. like, like, even with JT, like when we were doing jujitsu, like it was the same move over and over again. I'm like, yo, dude, like, come on. He's like, dude, no, you're going to, you're going to keep doing this over and over because it, 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 that's just what it is. That's what needs to be done. Right. Um, but sorry, next question. Uh, your favorite basketball player. And then that'll lead right into your top five. So I guess start with number one. Uh, so I'm a Magic Johnson guy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so at heart, just uh, Matt, he made me fall in love with the game. Yeah. And then uh, I think as I, get, as I get older, I love him. I love every player because you appreciate. But the thing is, when, you, when they're playing against your own favorite team, you start to, I'm a Lakers guy just because of Magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, so he's my favorite player of all time. How did you feel when LeBron came to Lakers? Then? I was I, super happy. Because okay. some of my friends are Laker fans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they, they hate him. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, my, my son's only known LeBron. Okay. Since he's been born. Like, every year he's been born, he's in the finals, right? And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We old guys, and my friends are the worst, because I'm older than you guys. They love to romanticize about how good the 80s were and the 90s were. They <laughs> were good. Yeah. But man, the rules were different. The talent level was much different. Um, you know, you can't compare. Uh, yeah, it's just different times, man. You gotta look at generations because it's like Gretzky was amazing in hockey. Yeah, but he's skating guys around guys who you know like beer league guys today, right? Yeah. But he's yeah. just so advanced at his age uh, at that in that era. Um, so, but and then you got all the young guys talking about guys they never saw play. Oh yeah, you know Will Chamberlain or Bill Russell, right? <laughs> and I was like, how do you know? You never watched them play live, or never. So I'm not a fan of when people comment about players they never saw play. Yeah. And uh, another thing is people get so defensive. If you don't mention their favorite player in a conversation, it doesn't mean that they're bad. Yeah. If someone's a top ten player of all time, out of billions of people who have played, that's an amazing feat. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, so. So you got Magic Johnson, and what's number two? Oh, so he's my favorite player. Yeah. Um, you would have him in your top five for sure. Yeah. So yeah. my my top five, again, you can look at it in any order. See, now the thing is, the first time I've been put in the spot on a, like a cap. Because <laughs> you hear all these guys are talking and one day they say someone else. One day, so Someone's going to watch this to come for you. <laughs> my, <laughs> They're going to be like, what? Trust me. I, I fight with all the young guys and old guys, and I would my conversations are I always defend the person that they're mocking. So okay. these guys might say something about bad about magic or LeBron or MJ or Kobe, and I'm always defending the person they're knocking down. Yeah. And uh, so my top five, because I never saw Will Chamberlain or Bill Russell play, so I can't comment. Okay. I saw the second half of Kareem's career. Yeah. Uh, so but my Mount Rushmore, my top four guys have always been Larry Bird, Maddie Johnson, Jordan, and LeBron. Mm-hmm. And that's not a knock on Kobe, Duncan, or Shaq, or Lajon. They're amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But again, like, I would say, man, like Jordan only won one playoff game without Pippen, right? And mm-hmm. then these guys like, well, you know, and these LeBron is too weak to play. Like, LeBron's the size of Karl Malone. He'd run, he'd run through that league in the 80s. Oh, yeah. The good thing is we, we shit on our kids because they're soft. Who made them soft? We did. <laughs> we bottled them. Yeah. And so if, if these rules were around, like, you know, back then, these guys would have, the greatest athletes adjust, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but like Magic, man, Magic has the best highlight reel. Yeah. They put on some 80s, like, show the hook shot, man, the hook shot, man. Yeah, just everything passes, man. Yeah, and, oh yeah, yeah. Um, but, I have no problem when someone says, hey, this person I think is the best player. I'm like, hey, man, they're great. Like Tim Duncan might be the yeah. most underrated player of all time. He's like 15-time All-NBA. 15 years, he's a top five player in the league, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, won like five championships. And he's super consistent, Tim Duncan. Yeah, and yeah. so we, but it's not sexy, it's boring, right? Yeah. And Larry Bird is a stone-cold killer, man, you know, and uh, like, you know, you shit your pants, like, oh, if Larry gets a ball in the last play of the game, you, know, you get scared and these guys again in the 80s it was magic and bird that saved the league and like so jordan was my favorite player after magic and i loved him 
But then, yeah, if you compare, like, the 90s was probably the worst decade of basketball because, you know, every team had maybe one good player, but no one had a, a Scotty and an MJ, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and all the same time, they had seven expansion teams. So the league was kind of watered down. So, like, if another team had a third good player, he'd probably be taken by another team. And, uh, but Jordan's amazing, man. Just, like, so, again, you start talking about this stuff, like, Colby, man, like, those three years from 20, 2008 to 10, like, so underrated. He just dominated the league, yeah. you know, in the playoffs. Yeah. Like, he lost in 08, but then came back and won in 9 and 10. Yeah. And it was just like, man, like, it's just, and the people shit on LeBron, like, he's the only guy I can think of who would probably score, if he wanted to, 40 a game in a year. Mm -hmm. If you look at his shot totals, they're so much less than all these other great players because he's passing the ball. And he'd take guys like you and me to the finals. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Literally. So, yeah. but the thing is, when we talk, like, give these people their flowers, man, because I don't see anything. Uh, like, you look at all these icons, like, the icons are Magic, uh, MJ, Kobe, and LeBron. Yeah. You're not going to see anyone, I don't think, after that, like, at that level for some time. Yeah. Yeah. And like, Katie and Steph are amazing, but it's like they've never been clear cut the best players in the league, you know, and, uh, LeBron's 38, like, you know, he's probably older than you guys. Yeah. yeah. Hey, how old are you? I'm 33. Yeah, so he's older than you guys dropping 30 a game, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but we got our, we got our buddies who are eating potato chips in the back, you know, talking about <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's just but again, you yeah, get, especially as you get older, man. When there's days you can't get out of bed sometimes just because you slept wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, <laughs> 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 I wasn't I wasn't a Tom Brady guy, and I'm like, man, Tom Brady for like 20 years was awesome. Yeah. And you know, uh you just enjoy these guys while they're here because you know, like you're never gonna get these icons again, right? No. Yeah. Um, next question. Let's just do uh, last one. Let's do the the uh the meal one, I guess. So oh, yeah. go ahead with that one. Uh, your favorite cheat meal, then we gotta ask everybody that. Cheat meal, man. It's like whatever I have coupons sitting in my front seat, which is pretty much every restaurant on Highway 10 here. <laughs> like you cross 176 here, there's a, what is where it? Be, a where Taco Bell be? KFC. Are you in Clayton Heights here? You're like my area? I'm in Cloverdale, like uh, right around 168 and Highway 10 now. Okay, okay. And uh, so right across the 176, there's a KFC and Taco yeah. Bell. Yeah, yeah. A&W, yeah. Wendy's across the street, Tim's and McDonald's. It's like, wow. but... I'm I'm still a pizza guy, man. Where's a where's a what's your go-to pizza place? Because Sonny's right a pizza now, guy too. Right now, uh, I don't discriminate against anybody. I'll eat them all. Yeah. But the one place, uh, probably like on this side of, not Alex Razor was probably Apollo Pizza in North Delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they remind me of Supreme Pizza in Vancouver, where I grew up. Okay. Just the way they make it, man. They uh. They got sold it, eh? Yeah. That's crazy, man. <laughs> like, and apparently they're like, I mean, I grew up in Van, right? I grew up in like the same uptown. Like, I think that's where oh, I grew nice. up. And it's crazy to see like how that sold and like just the legacy those guys left behind, man. Because we just had it recently and like they just sold it. There's new owners. They're changing the name. They're changing the oven. They're changing everything. Wow. Really? Yeah. They're not, they're not keeping anything. They're renovating the whole place. They're changing the menu. Because their their menu was set. They didn't do desi pizza, right? Their theirs was like pizza. Yeah. It, now these guys are coming in with the chicken pizza, <laughs> barbecue butter chicken pizza. They're uh, and they change. Oh. I think they're they're changing the name too, from what I've heard. So, man, yeah, those guys, stuff. legends. Man. Such an iconic brand. You said and, Apollo uh, Apollo is similar to that. Exactly. So same people. So I, I think family friends train Apollo. Okay. And if you look at the boxes, it's the same. It looks like Supreme, except it just says Apollo instead of Supreme. It was leg day tomorrow, bro. So that's what I'm going to I'm gonna have to check it out too then. I might get it today, it's, man. It's a little thing like <laughs> cheese. It's like cheese. Like the way the cheese is, it's like the restaurants today, the cheese is different. Yeah. yeah the, old, mean, uh, the other place I love going is Bazzini's on uh, yeah. Key Oh, Georgia. that's a good place. You that's can't a good go place. wrong with them. They're uh, the yeah, that they order when you do like takeout. Yeah. Oh man, that thing's deadly. We so. use it all. We use Bozini's a lot. Like, you know, especially during wedding weeks when my sister in law and brother in law yes. got married, 
they're tired of Indian food. So we're like, let's just go there. Grab, it's grab everyone's go to. So they got great Greek food and they got great veggie lasagna and great chicken lasagna. Yeah. Those. Really so it's bad. It's bad that when we know all these uh, menus inside out, right? Yeah. Pizza, places, <laughs> cool. like, pizza places I find like you just have to switch. Cause like, yeah, all the typical ones you just end up getting sick of it. Like if something did you, they're good for like a week and then two weeks, three weeks, and then boom, something they do something weird. You're not. I gotta go somewhere else. But you got variety. There's a lot of places now. You know what I mean? A lot and, of places. Uh, the so another thing is, people like man, like when I went to Greece and Italy and had food there. Yeah. The food at home actually I found tastes better. JT said the same thing. He's like the great the Greek food there was so traditional, like it didn't taste like here. It yeah, just tasted better. Yeah, here. like there's like maybe a few things, like you know, like the tzatziki and the pita bread, and you yeah. know, they have like that stuff that tasted really, really good. But like the actual Greek food that we get here, and I'm you know, really the certain dishes for whatever, maybe maybe that's what we're used to in terms of our palate and things. But I didn't really like it all that much over there. And even like pizza, I heard people go to uh, Italy and they have pizza there. They're like, pizza out here is better than it is there. Yeah, same. Yeah, I felt the same way. And yeah. again, I think it's. Our pizza is like their pizza on steroids. Yes, literally. <laughs> like extra, extra, more. You know? we're, we're like the type that is like, they're not topping, they're not putting toppings on you, man. What is this? One onion? <laughs> what is this? One piece of chicken? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, uh, so those, like, I love Greek. I love pizza. Greek and Italian are my favorite food, but man, I, I got to cut back on the burgers. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not the two guy. can dine man the two can guy get it gets you man <laughs> mcdonald's so expensive now too. i don't eat much mcdonald's anymore but like a and w like the juniors buddy cheeseburgers uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. and then wendy's always has these coupons coming out now man it's not good <laughs> well sam uh man thank you very much uh, for taking the time how can people reach you what are what are the avenues that are best to reach you you know what um i give out my personal mobile number uh it's seven seven eight eight nine six six nine seven two okay and also my email sim at sahi wealth um is it dot com <laughs> it's a dot c dot so sim at sahi wealth.com so sim at s-a-h-i wealth.com okay and, uh, again i just tell people if you guys have any questions feel free to reach out cool i'll be, I'll be calling you for sure yeah and what what i'll do is uh i'll actually get that information from you and then just put it in the description and in the show notes um, so then people have that, you know, they, if they were, you know, cause otherwise they're gonna have to rewatch and try to try to get it. So I'll just put it in the description, <laughs> but man, once again, thank you very much for taking the time. You know, it went a little bit longer than expected, but, um, uh, you know, some, some good laughs in there, some good information about finance, but we also got to see, you know, more about your early life, uh, some of your, you know, hobbies in terms of basketball, so, man, thank you very much once again for taking the time to sit down with myself just, and Sonny. Just, just, hey, appreciate yeah. it. Just make sure no one personally attacks me for my choice of top five players. I can, <laughs> yes. it, it might come. It's, <laughs> it's going to come. <laughs>